good morning. Welcome. We're doing good this morning. Merry Christmas. It's a lovely stage decoration we have here. It's very nice. Makes me in the holiday spirit, right? Well, I don't know about you, but, but this is obviously, I don't know if you're aware, but we, we frequently give gifts during this time of year. Who's aware of this concept? How many of you have gotten a gift? You really liked it. You enjoyed it. You, you were excited about it. And, and somewhere along the way, you lost it. Never to be seen again, right? This happened to my wife and I. I'd gotten her a bracelet uh, uh, right around the time our, our, our second daughter was born, and the clasp on the bracelet was was kind of, uh, I don't know, finicky, and I think my wife maybe hit her wrist on something at some point, and it knocked the, the bracelet open, and it fell somewhere, and somebody is walking around somewhere with a free bracelet uh, that I bought for them, uh, and it's not my wife, uh, but it just kind of dropped off. It just kind of disappeared. And, and, and we don't know. We, we looked everywhere. We looked in, in places where you would normally look for it. We looked in weird places. Like we took a car apart. We took our office apart. Like, I mean, we looked for this thing everywhere. And I don't know what, what Christmas is like for you, but there are certain themes, certain ideas, certain concepts that are supposed to accompany Christmas, right? We're supposed to be hopeful. We're supposed to be uh, uh, excited. We're supposed to be happy. We're supposed to be loving. We're supposed to be kind. We're supposed to be joyful, and I don't know if you've looked back over the years of the Christmases that you've had, but I wonder if you think that like that bracelet, like some gift that you lost, one of those ideas, one of those things that is supposed to accompany Christmas, somewhere along the way it dropped off. And Christmas is not a time for you to be hopeful anymore. It's not a time for you to be happy or loving. It's not a time for you to be joyful. We're walking through a series, kind of looking at the lyrics of joy to the world. And this week is Heaven and Nature Sing. And we're going to talk about some strange places, some obscure places, places that you wouldn't think to look for joy. We're going to look at four places. Because today we're kind of talking about the angels appearing to the shepherds and saying, I give you good news of great joy that will be for all peoples. So today we're going to look at four kind of random places. We're going to actually start in Deuteronomy. And how I wound up here was I was looking for the word joy, uh, I kind of did a search for the word joy in scripture, and I found uh, joy in some strange places that I didn't expect it. And I didn't expect that Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy would be the first place that the word joy or rejoice is mentioned in scripture. So the first place we need to look at is rejoice in work finished. Rejoice in work finished. So this is the first place where it's mentioned. And we're going to start in verse 13. You shall keep the feast of booths seven days when you have gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and your wine press. You shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns. For seven days you shall keep the feast to the Lord your God at the place that the Lord your will, will choose. Because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that you will be all together Joyful. Joyful. So the Israelites are about to go into the promised land, and it's a new generation of Israelites. This isn't the same group of people that came out of Egypt. That group has died off because of disobedience, and they're about to go and take the land, and so Moses is kind of recapitulating the law to them. So they're getting, they're getting the Ten Commandments again, they're getting all the laws about, about sacrifices, and they're getting instructions on the feasts. And the Hebrew calendar was largely oriented around three feasts. There was Passover, which many of us are familiar with around the Easter season. We talk a lot about Passover. There's the Feast of Weeks, and then there's the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. Now, up until about Jesus' time, and even probably a little bit through Jesus' time, the Feast of Week, or sorry, the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths was actually the most popular uh, of celebrations, of popular feasts, right? So it happened at the end of the agricultural cycle. So after the harvest was complete and they're kind of going into like the winter time, kind of after everything is done agriculturally, and it was a time for them to look back, as, as Deuteronomy instructs them, look back and see all that God has done through the work of their hands. They're to be grateful and thankful that God has worked in them and through them to bring up a crop. And so food is abundant. Food is, is, is excellent. It kind of sounds like Christmas, right? It's at the end of the year. Food is abundant, as we well know, and, and many of our waistlines are, will show, Right? Food is abundant, we're celebrating, we're celebrating what God has done. At the same time, because it's right before the new year, they're looking ahead. They're looking ahead to what God might do in the new year as well. And I think 
Interestingly enough, I think that our culture is kind of devoid of this opportunity to look back on the work that we've done and find satisfaction in it. Now, you might say Thanksgiving is the time to do this, but do we really use Thanksgiving for looking back? No, 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 no. We use Thanksgiving for looking ahead. Tomorrow's Black Friday, then Cyber Monday, then Giving Tuesday, followed by Explosion Wednesday, or whatever it is that we'll come up with next. We look ahead at Thanksgiving. You might say Labor Day or, or, or some other time. Maybe Christmas is a time for you to look back. But I think an intentional holiday for us to look back on what God has done in our work, in the actual work that we do on a regular basis. It's an opportunity, a place where we can find joy. And I think we miss out on it. And I think this is probably because unlike ancient Israel, the work that I do is so far separated from the food that I eat. Most of us in this room don't do anything to produce the food you eat. You do a job, you get paid for it, and then you go to a grocery store and you buy it. That's how most of us function. And that's very far separated from enjoying the fruit of your labor, unlike what Israel did where they worked to grow what they ate. Some of you, your work is so incredibly modular that you work on one small part of a larger project and you never see the final product. You know somewhere somebody is staying in a hotel that you designed, but you'll never see it. You'll never set foot in it. You'll never stay in it. And so it creates this disconnect, this lack of satisfaction. The paychecks that we take home. Very rarely do we actually take home a physical paycheck, right? It's direct deposit. And then the bills that I pay are directly deposited out of that account very quickly, suddenly afterwards. It's a very discouraging cycle. The work also that I do for many of us seems very far removed from actually directly helping somebody. The work I, I, you do, you might think, I'm in an office all day, I stare at a screen, and I don't see how it connects or helps anybody. And the church kind of unintentionally reinforces this, right? Every year around August, we have teachers and, and, and school professionals stand up and we pray over them, but we don't pray over accountants during tax season. Stockbrokers, sorry. Lawyers, never, ever. That's not happening. And maybe you guys need it, I don't know. Plumbers, God, you are the Lord's work, plumbers. You never appreciate a plumber until you need a plumber. And what's truly criminal here is the thing that I spend most of my time doing, Monday through Friday, or whatever your work is, 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a week, is divorced from the worship of God. The thing that you sacrifice your life for, the time from your family, friends, you sacrifice your health for it, is somehow devoid of the worship of God. Now, I'll be the first person to tell you, you should not find your identity in your work. You are so much more than whatever employee, employer that you are. But at the same time, we need to recognize and hold in balance that God very much values our work, and he derives worship from the work that we do. Think about the Christmas story. Mary gives birth to Jesus, and the angels go and proclaim the good news of the birth of the Messiah of everyone to a group of people, and what are they doing? They're at work. They're a bunch of blue-collar guys working. They are keeping sheep. They're not in a monastery. They're not poring over scriptures. The angels don't appear to them and say, Behold, you have been praying so long for us, and here we are. Your search is over. No, they were wrestling sheep, taking care of livestock. They were working. God values our work. And one of the strange places that you might find joy this season is looking back over your year and seeing how God has blessed you in your work. So how might we do this? How might we find satisfaction and joy in the work that we do and, and, and really uh, connect it to the worship of God? Because it's not just finding joy in work, it's finding joy in the Lord through your work. One of the things you can do is you can structure your job as a worship service. Now you might be able to Travis, that's weird. Yes, it is until you get used to it. At Park Cities, we work really hard to structure our worship services so that they flow. We have discussions about minute things that you would never ever think about, like do we pray here, or do we not pray here, do we, do we talk about this here, or where do we put this? We do a song here, we do a song here, and then Travis or Jeff is gonna come up and talk for 35 minutes, and it's gonna sound like an hour and a half because I'm hungry, but that's how long it's gonna go, really. And then we're gonna close with this. You should put the same intentionality into your workday. So maybe you start your workday with a prayer to the Lord. 
Lord, this is my day. This is what I have today. This is my calendar. Please bless the work of my hands. May it give you glory and honor. It doesn't have to be long. First coffee break, maybe read a psalm. Maybe read a couple verses of psalms. Maybe not a whole psalm. Then at lunchtime, maybe you go and walk once a week with a friend around maybe your, your, your complex, wherever it is that you work. You spend time with a friend and you talk about what God is doing in your work week that week. And then at the end of the day, as you close your day, you give thanks to the Lord. Before you go home, before you pack up all your stuff, you give thanks to the Lord, God, thank you for using me at work today. I pray that whatever I have done contributes to your glory, and I pray that you would use it to magnify your name. Boom. It's that simple. There are actually books that help you do this. If you're a supervisor, if you're somebody's boss, you aren't just a boss, you're their pastor. You are a shepherd. We... Traditionally, human beings have worked in agriculture, and we've cultivated food, wheat, right? Most of us don't do that anymore. We work in a service industry where we cultivate people. You're responsible for bringing up people to follow the Lord, whether they believe in him or not. You shepherd them. If they're going through a difficult time, if they've lost a loved one, if they're going through a divorce, bosses, that's your job to help them navigate that because they're looking for answers. You find a great deal of satisfaction. You need to fight for your employees. Fight for them to get promotions. When they screw up, fall on the sword for them. Don't throw them under the bus. Because that's what shepherds do. That's what pastors do. Then also consider how God is using you and using your work to make the world around you flourish. Everybody in this room, no matter what your job is, unless it is directly in violation of what God has called human beings to do, unless it is that, does something to contribute to the flourishing of humanity. And you might sit there and think to yourself, Travis, I, I, I pave roads. Well, guess what? Trucks drive over roads and trucks deliver to Kroger delicious ice cream sandwiches that I eat. Without you, I would not have my ice cream sandwiches and I would have one less reason to give glory to God because I don't have my ice cream sandwiches. So I praise God for you. Accountants, you might think, I just look at numbers all day. Yeah, but those are, that's money. And if that money doesn't go to the right place to the right people, then my kids go hungry, your kids go hungry, other people's kids go hungry because we don't have money to buy the food that we need. Everybody is doing something to contribute to the flourishing of humanity. Find satisfaction in God through your work because he's using you. So that's the first sort of un, un, up, obscure, sort of strange place you might find joy. You might find the Lord working this years, looking back. But the second place is over in 1 Chronicles 16. Turn me to 1 Chronicles 16. I'll give you a little context for this. Chronicles is a book written by a, a historian who lived after the events happened that he, he's writing about. So he's looking back, and, and obviously I guess most people write about stuff like that, but this is a long time afterwards. He's looking back on the time of David, and it's after the exile. It's after Israel's been kicked out of the land for disobedience. And they're coming back, and he's sort of looking at it historically. And he's writing, and he's writing about the, the, the bringing in of the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark was a special box that had the Ten Commandments inside of it, had some other things in it. But the most important thing about the Ark of the Covenant was that, not just Indiana Jones, but that God's presence dwelt where the Ark was. And so wherever the ark went, that's where the presence of God was. And it's being brought into Jerusalem by King David. It's been parked in some guy's garage for a while, and he's been eminently blessed because of it. So it's being brought into, and, and, and David is singing, and we pick up the song in verse 28. And I want you to notice how inanimate creation is rejoicing at this event happening, because one of the places that we can find joy, where we can rejoice, is in creation flourishing. Look at verse 28 of chapter 16. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. And then, and then the inanimate creation jumps in. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. And let them say among the nations the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy. Before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. That, second, that last verse is going to pop up again. What's really unique about this, this story is that the Ark of the Covenant, by the time this man is writing or woman is writing, they don't know what happened to the Ark. It disappeared. We still don't know what happened to it. But this is an exciting event because the presence of God is going to be amongst the people and all of creation is joining in in the song. Heaven and nature 
are singing. Scripture is full of examples of non-human creation jumping in in the celebration and worship of God. In Numbers 22, a donkey talks to a man. And I am cursed forever because I cannot read that passage without hearing Eddie Murphy be the donkey. <laughs> it's basically Shrek. Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm 50, verse 6, the heavens declare his righteousness. In Luke 19.40, Jesus says, if the people don't praise me, the rocks themselves are going to cry out. Creation loves its creator, loves him. And in return, God loves his creation. He loves what he's made. If you walk through the Genesis story, creation story, after every day, God makes something and he declares it to be good. It's good. I'm finding such joy in the thing that I have made. And it is unfortunate and is something to lament over that conservative Christians, people who hold the, the gospel, people who, who bend their, their, break their backs, bend, bend their wallets to bring the gospel to places far, far away, we care so little about the places that those people live in. We care so little about the creation around us. We miss out on the fact that our redemption as human beings is intimately tied to the redemption of all of creation. Romans 8 teaches this. Creation is groaning for the resurrection of human beings. God's grace is not just for us to be sucked out of here and taken into heaven. It is so that we might have a restored heaven and earth. God has this thing called common grace, and it's poured out on all peoples, on all things, right? Common grace, it goes everywhere, it's for everyone. So you wonder why, why bad people have good things happen to them. It's because of common grace. It's because God is good to human beings. But he's, it's also true about inanimate creation. Things like the rain's falling, God provides the rain. He gives food to everything that needs it. God provides. Job 38, 39 to 41. Job, God's in the middle of this speech with Job where, where Job's kind of arguing with him about why has all this happened to me? And, and God's responding like, Did, can you do this? Do you know how many hailstones are in heaven? Do you, know, do you know all this? And then he says this really cool thing. He says, do you hunt prey for the lion? Do you hunt prey for the lion or provide the ravens with their food? Think about this. I think when we think about God providing food for animals, we think of him being like, here you go. Here's a gazelle. Or like he's made stuff and now nature kind of works on its own. Kind of this deist model of like stepping back and God just kind of lets nature run. Job seems to imply that God is actively working with the lion to help him find the gazelle that he will eat. Or she will eat. I guess the women do the hunting. And then when the gazelle escapes, God is also in charge of that. God cares for his creation. Did you know there are stars that have been born burned out and died that nothing has ever seen except for the eye of the creator because he celebrates and loves his creation. As Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to care for creation. We need to care about the creation that God has made. And it's not because we need to save the world. It's not because we need to live in fear that ice caps are melting and seas are rising and all that stuff, although that is appropriate and we should take that into account regardless of where you stand on that discussion. But we need to care about creation because God cares about creation. And he made Adam and Eve to steward the creation that he made. And if he made them to do that, and they're made in the image of God, and we're made in the image of God, then we find our purpose, part of our purpose in that, in stewarding creation. And when you are living out of your purpose, do you know what happens in your life? You find joy. You find joy when you're doing the thing that God has made you to do. And God has made humans to care for his creation. I mean, think about Christmas story. Think about the Christmas story. Look at the role that nature plays in that story. How does Mary get to Bethlehem? Does she walk? No, she rides on what? The back of an Eddie Murphy talking donkey. He doesn't talk in that one, just kidding. A star does what? Guides the men, guides the kings, the wise men to Bethlehem. Angels, not humans, angels get to proclaim the glory of God. Shepherds are literally taking care of animals when they hear the good news of Jesus Christ. They're literally involved in creation care when God announces to them. So let's rejoice in creation. 
Again, I'm not saying go hug a tree, don't go worship uh, the created things. That's not what I'm talking about. But God has given us this, this thing that is flourishing, and we are required to take care of it and honor him in it. So how do we do this? Well, we live in a city, and many of us work in an office. One of the things that I would encourage you to do is to get out in nature to begin with, right? Find, find time to get out in nature. And if you don't believe me, if you don't agree with kind of where this is going, if you're surprised at this, go play with a puppy. Go play with a kitten and tell me you don't feel something. Go take a walk on a beach or in the mountains and tell me you don't feel something something. So get out in nature. Spend time with the created things that God has made. And if this is like totally like, nah, maybe pray that God would give you a heart for creation care. Secondly, there's all sorts of ways, things that you can do. These are pretty common, so don't be surprised. Um, You can recycle. Yes, you're in a sermon and it's talking about recycling. Reduce, reuse. There you go. Recycle. Cut down on the use of paper products. That's a good way. If you want an animal, try adopting one rather than a breeder. These are all things. Like I said, I know this sounds strange, especially around Christmas. Trust me, I I thought about as I was working through this, this sounds strange. But if we're looking for joy and we're looking for joy in unexpected places, I can't think of a more unexpected place than this. And you might find God doing something and working in your life. Now, for some of you in here, many of you, you might be thinking, Travis, this is way far off the mark. You might say, you don't understand what Christmas is like for me. I'm not thinking about accomplishments. I'm not thinking about taking care of other things or other people. I'm deeply, deeply hurting. I am grieving at Christmas. Where am I supposed to find joy in that? Where actually, you can rejoice in grief comforted. Rejoice in grief comforted. Look at Ezra 3. Look at Ezra chapter 3. So we're staying in the exiles, and Ezra has gone back to the promised land with a group of other exiles to rebuild the temple of God. And we're coming in the scene where they're actually, because the temple of God was destroyed by the Babylonians, so they're actually laying the foundation and they're celebrating because they've laid the foundation. And we come upon the scene in verse 10. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets and the Levites and the sons of Asaph with symbols to praise the Lord according to the directions of King David, of David king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of father's houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted for joy so that the people could not distinguish between the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with such a great shout, and the sound was heard far away. So what's happening is you have one group of people who's excited about what God is doing. The laying of the foundation. This is what God has promised. We're back in the land. Everything's going to be better. And you have one smaller group of people over here who remember what the old temple looked like. They either remember the size of the temple or they remember that it was much more ornate, and they see the foundation and they realize, even though this is a new temple, it's not going to be the way it was. We're never actually going to go back to the good things that we had before. This is a new thing that God is doing. And they grieve. And some of you might find yourself in this spot during Christmas. You have a whole host of people over here celebrating, rejoicing, being happy, spending time with family, spending time with friends. And you're a part of this subset of people who are grieving who are sad because you realize that Christmas is never going to be the way Christmas was when you were happy, when you were joyful. And it's like a knife twisting. Every time somebody says rejoice, you're like, "Mm mm-mm. Every time somebody says be joyful, nope. You're tired of being told it's Christmas and you should smile. Here's what I can tell you about that. Christmas is about more than joy. Joy is to be found in the midst of grief. It's one of these strange places that you can find it. I think this is why the best Christmas songs, or what I think are the best Christmas songs, are the ones that have weight and gravity to them. Think about O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. It's this song about hope and expectation and longing for, the, for Christ. And when we sing it in, in, in this part of, of history, we know that Christ has come. And so we sing it with, with sort of this tinge of joy to it. But you think about the way it's sung. It's, 
sad. It's almost a dirge. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. It's this lament, almost. Think about, oh, holy night, solemn, it's weighty, silent night, solemn and weighty. Why? Because I think we understand that to grasp Christmas, you have to hold both grief and joy in different hands, but you have to hold them together. Because on one hand, we are thrilled that the Messiah has come, but we are devastated that he had to come in the first place. We're thrilled that our sins have been paid for, but we're broken over the fact that we even had sin to begin with. We're thankful that the grief and the hurt is going to magnify the glory of God in our lives, but we're devastated that we have the grief and the hurt anyway at all. The angels appear to the shepherds and they say they have good news of great joy. That will be for who? All people. Not just happy people, not celebrating people, but lonely people, hurting people, grieving people. Because that baby in a manger is going to grow up. He's going to be a man. And he's, he's the son of God. And he's going to say things like, blessed are those who mourn because they're going to be comforted. He's going to say he came for the hurting. He came for the lost. He came for the sick. And then what's said in Isaiah 53 is going to be true of him. It's going to say this. Isaiah 53, the prince of peace, the wonderful counselor, is also described this way. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. They're talking about the Messiah. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds we are healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christmas is for the grieving. Because Jesus Christ came for the grieving, the hurting, the wounded. And so we find a reason to rejoice because there's hope. And it's a strange place to find joy in the midst of grief, but it's there. We need not look for it. We need only look for Christ. And we find joy as a side effect. The last place that we'll look for joy, you probably would say, oh, it doesn't seem all that strange. But I think we hear it so much that we've almost forgotten to look for joy in it. And it is in salvation fulfilled. Rejoice in salvation fulfilled. I'm actually going to read you one of my favorite passages in Scripture. We're in Isaiah 55. And it starts in verse 1. It says, Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, come to me here, that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. God is inviting everyone, regardless of race, ethnicity, regardless of what you've done, come and eat and dine with him. Spend time with him. He wants to draw close to you. And you may think it's absolutely ridiculous because you may think God is far off. God may love other people, but he doesn't love me, Travis. You don't know what I've done. You don't know the people that I've hurt. You don't know how I've made a mess of Christmas. The reason why there's no joy in my Christmases is because of what I've done. You say, there's no way that God can forgive me. Well, verse 6 and verse 7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him when he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. God wants to do this for you. And you may think, why? Why does God want to reconcile his enemies? And he tells us in verse eight, he says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. When we have an enemy, we do everything we can to neutralize them or crush them so they can't hurt us again. 
when God has an enemy, he dies for them. And he reconciles them to himself so that they can rejoice and have happiness and have plenty and have wholeness. And we think, why? And he says, because my ways aren't your ways. I do things differently than you do them. And if you come and you draw close to me, you'll learn how I do things and you will find joy. You will rejoice. You will celebrate in the way that I do things. And he's going to do this because he's declared to do it. And you can trust this guarantee that he has made because he says it in verse 10. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it will accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Jesus Christ is the word of God and he was sent by God into the world to rescue and redeem and restore us so that we might have joy, that we might have hope. We need to only put our faith and our trust in him because God has declared this to be the case and God's declarations have power. It's not just me up here being like, this is how it is. God creates. How does he create? He speaks. And when he speaks things into existence, they actually happen. God has spoken and his word does not return empty. It does not fail. And it will not fail in your life. And this is the greatest joy that I can offer you today. That baby lying in a manger grows up to die for you and for me. And I'm right with God because of it. Because of the faith that I've put in him. And you can have that today. You can have that hope. I don't know what you're looking for this Christmas. I don't know what you're looking forward to. Christmas is definitely a time of expectation and hope. In fact, that's what Mary, that's what Joseph, that's what every Israelite is doing in the Christmas story. They're looking for the Messiah And when he comes, Mary says, sings this beautiful song. We call it the Magnificat. She says, finally, the Lord has had mercy on me because I get to have a front row seat. I get to see this firsthand, what God is going to do. Some of you in this room, you're aching, you're hurting, you're drowning in your sorrows, in your pain, you're longing for God's forgiveness and his mercy in your life. And whatever pain you're going through, maybe it's self-inflicted, maybe it's not. Maybe you're the victim of someone or just circumstance. But it may be that God has done, has allowed this to happen in your life. Because your heart has been ripped open, it's been torn open. And God has allowed it to go on just long enough so that your heart might be exposed in like soil that's been prepared for a seed. You rip open the dirt to plant a seed, right? Right? God maybe has ripped open your heart, allowed that to happen so that you might be ready to receive a seed of hope, a seed of joy, a seed of salvation. And today might be the day that he plants that seed in your heart. And all you have to do is trust him. All you have to do is trust the sower, that he's going to sow good seed in the wounds of your life. And you just put your faith in him. You're just going to trust him. You're going to draw close to him. Because he's a good farmer, he's a good shepherd, he's going to take care of you. And so you let him. You abide in him, you rest in him. We're about to sing a song that, for me personally, has meant a lot to me. And by we, Han is going to sing it for us. And he's going to sing it over us. And I want this to be our prayer. And it's actually Isaiah 55 put to music. And I I struggle with anxiety. I I have that issue in my life. And I have found that in seasons where I have been longing for God to do something, to, to take away this fear in my life, I've come to this song and been able to look ahead and know that, that these wounds, they're going to produce a fruit, a crop, in my life and the life of other people. And so I hope you hear this. I hope you pray it with me. Every time I hear it, I pray it. Because he's going to do something great. And then you see it. You see it at the end. This is what he offers us. For you shall go out in joy. Be led forth in peace. And the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Notice it's creation again. And instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. And instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord. 
an everlasting sign that will not be cut off. We can have hope and joy that it will not be cut off. So let's rejoice together as Hans sings.